So apparently, Job had some time to think. He began to think about his past and reflect on his life, and he began to long for the good old days. Listen to what Job says in Job chapter 29, verse 2. He says, Oh, that I was as in the months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through the darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured out rivers of oil. Let's pray. Father God, here we come to Job's deep reflections, contemplations about what once was. Lord, you know that Job is depressed. He's in despair. He is reflecting on his past and he's longing for the good old days to come again. Lord, all of us perhaps have thought about our life and reflected on past events and have also longed for the good old days to return. But Lord, help us to remember that in the sovereign work of God, the good old days are just a shadow of the best days to come. That you are going to do a new thing in our lives. And we've got to somehow and some way get out of our dismal despair and realize that God is not through with us yet. Lord, help us to learn from Job that although we may sustain some losses, we can regain an awareness of God's providence, of God's provision, of God's protection, and of God's purpose in our lives. And Lord, we'll make sure that you get the praise and the honor and the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. In distress, surely Job was thinking and pondering about the times of his prosperity and wealth. And also those moments that he had such close intimacy with the Lord God Almighty. Here we see that his spiritual relationship was strained. He had... Um, a state of heart that was dark at this point. And he was also thinking about the loss of his children and his possessions and his great wealth and prosperity. He was depressed in his soul because he sensed that he had lost the light of God's countenance upon his life. Have you ever been there when you feel like that God is not as real as he used to be. Your faith is not as strong as it ought to be. When God's presence was so precious and endearing and warming to you. Well, here we find Job in that exact situation. He once walked in the light of God's presence. He had such deep, profound spiritual insights and wisdom that he automatically knew what decision he'd have to make. But now he had lost his awareness of God's presence and power and unlimited potential in his life. Today, get out your outlines. I, I want us to look at two major things. I want us to see the loss that was sustained, but also I want you to see the awareness that was gained. First of all, Job's loss that was sustained. We all know if you've been with me the last several months that we've been a series of sermons to the book of Job and we know that he lost all of his children in one day. What a horrific thing to experience. We know that he lost all of his wealth and all of his prosperity and all of his health and uh, Job was in an ash heap with boils, excruciating pain. But I want you to know that Job also had lost some things in his spiritual life. And sometimes you and I can lose things in the physical. As long as we have the spiritual, we'll be okay. Amen? But here Job began to lose the sense of the spiritual. Here Job longs for the good old days because, and write this down, he lost his awareness of God's providence. You see, there was a time in Job's life in which he knew beyond a shadow of doubt that God's guiding hand was upon him. 
He could see the supernatural protection of God from evil. And he knew that God had built an impenetrable, invincible, impregnable hedge of protection around him and his family. He was so conscious of God's spirits working in his life that he just immediately, regularly obeyed God without question. But now we find Job in a different situation. He had lost his awareness of God's providential care in his life. But I'm here to tell you that God's word teaches us that God's providential working is in every one of our lives. Amen. Whether we feel it or not, whether we see it or not, God is providentially taking care of us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I declare to you, I have a plan for you, not a plan of calamity, but for welfare to give you hope and a future. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Remember when uh, Joseph looked at his brothers that caused so much misery and mayhem upon his life, and he said that great statement in Genesis 50, verse 20, says, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I want you to know that when we talk about this eternal life in Christ, we're not just talking about a life that goes on forever and ever and ever, but we're talking about a life that can never be separated from God's presence and God's love. In Romans 8, Paul says it so beautifully. He says, who can separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, perils or the sword? In all things we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. And then he says, for I am fully persuaded, neither life nor death, nor power or principality or angel, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that you and I have a blessed assurance today to know that our life is in the palm of the hand of the almighty God of the universe. And that's why he tells us, fear not. For I will be with thee. Be dis not dismayed. For I am thy God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will lift you up with my right hand of righteousness. What beautiful promises of God's providential care. But see Job longed for the good old days. Because he lost his awareness of God's providential care in his life. But number two I want you to see that he lost his awareness of God's provision in his life. We see this in. Job chapter 29, verse 2, you can look at it in a few minutes, but here we see that he, he tells of a time in which God was not just providentially taking care of him, but providing for him in a supernatural way. He was so sure of God's provision that the Son of God shined upon his life and he rejoiced in it. Remember, before he lost his children, before he lost his wealth, before he lost his health, the Bible says that early in the morning he'd get up and meet God. And he'd pray and he'd sacrifice to God. And here Job is reminiscing about that excitement in his life that he once had, the exuberant relationship that he shared with his Lord God, Creator Almighty. Even after he lost all of his children, after he lost all of his possessions. Remember those people that kept coming back and giving repetitive reports that his daughters and sons had died and then the Sabaeans came and took the cattle and all those tragedies, all those loss. But you know what the Bible says Job did? Job rose up, he rented his robe and he shaved his head which was an ancient gesture of overwhelming grief. And then he fell down on the ground and worshipped God. And through all of this, the Bible says that he did not sin or charge God foolishly. Even in the midst of this tremendous loss and, and tragedy, there was a prevailing peace that became a constant factor in Job's life. The sun of God's love shines so bright around him, it didn't even cast a shadow. Now that's brilliance. Brilliance. The triumph and the victory reflected in his life, even when he lost his health. Remember how his wife, we got bitter and said, won't you just curse God and die? Remember what Job said? He said, should not we receive good from God and not bad? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Then his friends came along. With friends like Job, who needs enemies? Friends can be toxic, can't they? They sat there quiet for a week, and they should have stayed quiet the rest of the weeks, but they didn't. And they begin to bombard him with criticism and accusations of some secret sin. That's why he was suffering, but that was furthest from the truth. Here we see Job begin to wear, don't we? We don't see the confident Job we did at the very beginning. We see a Job in chaos, mayhem, and misery. I want you to know that God doesn't want you to be wore down, wiped out, or burn out by the stress and strain and pressure and pains of life. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 and 33? He said this, he said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body that what you shall put on is not life more than meat and body more than raiment. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? You see, God's trying to tell us something that you and I don't have to worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear, how we're going to be sheltered. That's God's concern. You don't have to worry about it. Remember when Paul was in prison? I don't know if you've ever been in prison or incarcerated, but it's a very lonely place to be. A place away from all the conveniences of being free. And here Paul was placed there for preaching the gospel. But yet in the midst of all this seemingly dark moments and dark places, he gave us a wonderful promise in Philippians 4.19 that says, But my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad there's no shortage in God's storehouse? It's indepletable, inexhaustible, and ever available to everyone who names the name of Jesus. You and I can rest assured. We can be at peace whether we're in a good place or a bad place. A place full of light or a place full of darkness. God's providential care is going to take care of us and he's going to supernaturally provide for us. Sometimes we have to learn to Trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not to our own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all our ways and He'll direct our paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Wow, what powerful promises. You see, Job began to lose the uh, awareness of God's presence in his life. Uh, but also, I want you to know that he's longing for the good old days because not only has he lost the awareness of God's providence and God's provision, but also, write this down, of God's protection. In Job chapter 29, verse 3, he says, In his light I walked in darkness. Here Job expresses darkness. You know we're all vulnerable to dark moments in our lives. Amen? And here he is making a statement that there was a time in his life that the light of God shined so brightly, it was so illuminous, that he knew which step to take and, and when to take it. He walked in such close communion with God, but now he's lost his sense of awareness of God's presence and of God's power and of God's provision and God's providential care. Remember, he's in darkness. He's been alienated. Who's he been alienated from? His own family. Not just talking about his children that died or his wife that told him to curse God and die, but where was his brothers and sisters? Where was his cousins? Where was all his, his niece and nephews? Where, where were his aunts and uncles? Where were his family? They had deserted him, and he was filled with despair. Job said there was one time that my path was brightly lit with the glory of God, but now it is enshrouded in darkness and I'm stumbling in the dark. Have you ever been in the dark? I remember when I went to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky and they turned out the light. It was so dark you could cut it. You were afraid to move because of impending danger that you sensed. Matter of fact, when you were in the dark, you had the propensity, or propensity, should I say, of making a step that you would not make if you were in the light and could see what was in front of 
When you're in the dark, you're, you're more apt to injury. You're more uh, 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 prone to fear and worry and anxiety. You will take steps that you would normally not take and, or, or either make some serious mistakes in your life because you don't sense the, the guiding presence of God. Job felt like that. We've all felt like that at times. We've all had our dark nights of the soul. But aren't you glad for the scriptures? <laughs> This word is full of verses given to God's people that are facing difficult, dark times because of their faith. Remember what the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6? It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with the things as that you have. For I say unto you, I will never leave thee or forsake thee, so that thou might boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what men can do to me. See, you and I are, are going to face some difficult times. We may be overwhelmed by situations and circumstances, but you can rest assured in the wonderful words that God said to Paul when you face those dark moments. Remember what God said to Paul? He said, and he said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God or of Christ might rest upon me boy those are great and precious promises aren't they you see Job began to long for the good old days because he had lost his awareness of God's providence he lost his awareness of God's uh, provision he lost his awareness of God's protection but now I want you to know that he has lost his awareness of God's purpose in his life here in Job chapter 29 verse 4 he talks about when he was in his prime of life when he was young here he begins to reminisce about when he was young and idealistic and he could sense the presence and the will of God. He, he said, in my youth, I, I was on a mission for God. I could see things of God so clearly. He had such enthusiasm, excitement, exuberance. Remember when you first met the Lord? Remember that first love? Remember that spiritual romance? You couldn't get enough of Jesus, could you? He remembers in his youth when he had such a fresh uh, encounter with God. He says, in my youth, God revealed the secret things to me. He said, I, I knew the purpose of God and I had committed my ways to do his purpose. No wonder Job longed for the good old days, amen. Many of us sitting here in this church probably could identify with Job. Wasn't there a time in your life when the purpose of God was more important to you than anything in this world? Maybe like Job, we've lost that song that rang deep into our hearts. Maybe we've lost that excitement, that zeal, that thrill that used to bubble up from our soul. Maybe we've lost the awareness of his presence or that unbridled passion to do his will regardless of what we face in life. Many of us would be honest, we probably strayed away from the Lord and we long for those good old days, those yesteryears. Yes, Job had lost the awareness of God's providence, of God's presence, of God's protection, of God's provision, but also of God's purpose. You know, Job's not the only one that went through something like that in the Bible. You remember the disciples? Especially that of Simon Peter. We can trace his steps and when he began to lose his awareness for the presence of the Lord and his passion to do his will. Remember the first thing when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus took them in the garden and wanted them to pray with him one hour. Remember that scenario? And he, had, he positioned them here in the garden. He went further on in the garden where he could have some privacy. And he came back in an hour or two. And what did he find his disciples doing? Were they praying? No, they were sleeping. Just like half of our members are doing Sunday morning right now. They're sleeping. They went to Bedside Baptist. That's where they're at. I hope they get on our Facebook and get this message. They found him sleeping. He found him sleeping. 
He looked at Simon Peter and said, Simon Peter, are you sleeping? Can you stay up one hour with me? Watch and pray lest you fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. What about when Jesus was arrested? He needs someone to stand beside him to support him in this real bad predicament he was in. Where were the disciples? Can anybody tell me? They fled. They forsook him. But Peter had a gallant moment. Let's give Peter some credit. He got the sword out and went to behead the servant of the high priest and he missed his head. He's a terrible swordsman, but he severed off his ear. And Jesus took Malchus's ear and put it back on him. And all of a sudden, Peter's fading in the background, following Jesus at a distance. We can trace those Steps of Peter stepping away from our Lord even further. Remember when he was in the courtyard of the high priest? He was warming himself by the fire with some strangers. At least they, he thought they were strangers. They began to identify him. They said, you're one of the Christ followers. And he said, this man you're talking about, I, I do not know. He said that three times. Remember Jesus told us, told him he would do that. He said, before the rooster crows twice, I'm gonna, you'll deny me three times. And that's exactly what happened. And as Jesus was coming out and the rooster had already crowed the second time, remember the Bible says Jesus looked at Peter. And that look spoke volumes of words. And Peter went out and wept. Simon Peter, like all of us from one time or another, knows what it means to lose the closeness of fellowship with his Savior. Like Job, Simon Peter now only thought of times when they were different. He could only recall and reminisce how close he was with his Savior and his Lord before he breached that fellowship. Why did the disciples forsake the Lord? Why did Peter so strongly deny the Lord? I think there was two reasons according to what Jesus said. First, fear. You know, the authorities came to arrest him. He was under the authorities. And the disciples were afraid that they would be the next ones to be arrested. But I want you to tell you something about fear, because we all will deal with it. Fear is not of God. Do you hear me? If you have fear and dread in your life, God did not put it there. You say, how in the world can you say that? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and of power of a sound mind. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, it says, Love has no fear, for perfect love cast out fear. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. For we love him because he what? Loved us. I love Psalms 27, verses 1 through 2. That's not in your outline, so put that in your outline. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, and whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength in my life, and whom shall I be afraid of? You know, sometimes I get fearful. I'm pastor. Sometimes I'll have this feeling of dread come over me, but that's not Jesus. That's Satan himself. And the devil will use that emotion of fear to keep you from being loyal and faithful like you should be to the Lord. But not only do we see fear, but also they were weak in the flesh. They, but they were very self-confident. They were almost cocky at being confident. Remember when they were in the upper room at the Last Supper and they swore their undying love to the Lord Jesus Christ? None of them would have thought they would have forsaken him or flee from him at his moment of need. Apparently they had not learned the lesson Jesus tried to teach them in John 15. Without me you can do nothing. Amen? Listen to me. I want to teach you a very important lesson if you've not already learned it. And it's going to be contradictory to what the world teaches. Do I have everybody's attention? The most vital lesson you can learn is distrust yourself. I know the world says believe in yourself, believe in yourself, believe in yourself. I know what the world teaches. I know we teach our kids believe in themselves, believe in themselves. Let me tell you something. You better believe in the Lord God Almighty. Amen. I don't believe in self-confidence in a Christian. I believe in God-confidence in a Christian. 
They were so self-confident, self-confident that they got cocky about it and blew it. The only way that you and I can have strength, the kind of strength that is supernatural and sustaining and consistent, is by spending time with God and in His Word and what we're doing today, congregating with one another. Listen to me. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is, but encourage one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. You need a community of believers. I need you, you need me, we need each other. When you lay in bed on Sunday morning when you can be here, pretty soon you're going to lose your passion, your thrill, your zeal for Jesus. Amen? That is an absolute truth. I've seen it over and over and over and over again in my pastorate. Unless you and I keep a constant vigilance and maintain diligence about our spiritual life, we are going to start to drift aimlessly. Unless I consciously obey God on a day-by-day -day basis, guess what will happen? I'll lose my awareness of God and my passion for God. And eventually, I'll push Him away. My love will grow cold. My passion will lose its fire. And I will begin to fade. And guess what? When that happens, you're going to find yourself on a journey that doesn't have God's guidance. And you're going to discover too late that you are somewhere where you do not want to be. You're going to find out the destination was not worth the journey or the trip. But aren't you glad that God has a worthwhile journey and destination? Man, he came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. He said, those that know God shall be strong and do great exploits. God has a worthwhile journey. But in order to fulfill that journey, you and I have to maintain discipline. And we've got to guard our spiritual life and our love for the Lord, that first love that the Bible talks about. Matter of fact, turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. We may have it on the overhead. But here I want you to see what the, the Spirit of God is saying to the church in Ephesus. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and thou hath, that canst not bear them that are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And thou hast borne and hast had patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. In other words, he's saying, You've been faithful, you've been orthodox in your beliefs, you have the right theology, you're doing all the right ministries, all the right activities, but I want to tell you, I have something against you. Nevertheless, I have something against you because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, wherefore thou which thou hast fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Pretty clear, isn't it? My friends, you and I can even be sitting in the pew, doing all the right things, going to all the right places, being involved in all the right activities, all the right ministries, and still lose a heart for God. That's pretty powerful. Here I want you to see... Job's loss sustained. But let's, let's talk about how to regain our awareness of God. Are you ready? Here we go. Maybe most of us have not maintained our diligence in our spiritual life. And we've lost that love for the Lord. We've lost the sense of his presence, his power, and our passion for the Lord. We've had a loss sustained how can we do more than just long for the good old days? Well, I believe that as we look at the disciples, we're going to see some things that they did to regain the awareness of God's presence and power and unlimited potentials. And here they are. First of all, the disciples regained their awareness of God because they surrendered to his will. They surrendered to his will. We can pattern our, pattern our personal a spiritual renewal by the example of the disciples. And you see, if there's any area in your life that is outside the will of God, you've got to surrender it afresh and anew to the Lord. Do you realize that the early disciples struggled with surrender at the very beginning? 
Remember when Jesus told them about, about he was going to die and his departure, and, and a lot of them got really frustrated and, and aggravated and upset. And, and Peter even said, Lord, may it be far from you. And remember what Jesus said to Peter? It was stern. He said, Satan, get behind me, for you favor the things of man more than the things of God. The idea is very clear and plain there that they had not surrendered to the plan of God. But eventually they did surrender, praise God. They may not have understood the, the full scope of his plan, <coughs> but they surrendered. They followed God whether they understood the plan or not. And God gave them a, a fresh fellowship and power and effectiveness in their service. This is what I'm trying to say. Until you and I totally surrender to God, we'll always long for the good old days. You know, I've got to realize we're out of fellowship with God if there's any area in our life that's out of the will of God. And we've got to confess that. In 1 John 1, 9, it says that we'll confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we finally figure out we're not where we ought to be, we can get to where we ought to be. Then we can surrender our will to him and be led by the Spirit of God. And as we... Do not grieve the Spirit in our hearts with our attitudes and actions and we don't quench the Spirit's movement in our life, then we're going to regain that awareness of God's presence and God's power once again. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Number two, write this down. Not only are we to surrender to His will, but we've got to be determined in prayer. Do you realize the early disciples spent ten days together praying because of the condition of their heart? Remember that upper room experience in Acts chapter 1 and 2? Go home and read those great passages of the scripture. Uh, right after they returned from the ascension of Christ and they stayed together in that upper room until the day of Pentecost and they began to pray for God's purpose to be fulfilled in their life. They were praying for a fulfillment of God's promise where they would be energized with power from on high so that they could be dynamic witnesses in the world around them. Here we see it very clearly how you and I can regain our awareness of God's presence and power. Have you ever lost the fellowship of God in your life? You know how you get it back? Spending time with God. You want to restore that awareness of God's presence? You want to regain that sense of God working in your life? And you've got to get serious about prayer. Amen? And one of the things that I'm very concerned here is about the lackadaisicalness of some of our members on Wednesday nights. You know, this church will never grow until we make Wednesday night a priority night to come and pray together. Amen? I know you may be praying out there on your individual uh, homes, and that's good, and we need that personal, intimate place of prayer. But guess what? We need to congregate together and pray for one another and pray for the growth of this church and the outreach of this community. And I want to ask you, and I want to challenge you to be more faithful on Wednesday night. Now, I know most churches don't have a good attendance on Wednesday night. As I look over my pastor, there's been only one church that had a terrific attendance on Wednesday night. But that's no excuse for us. Amen? You see what I'm saying? When the disciples got serious about God, God got serious about them. And when Job began to be determined in his prayer, guess what? Read the last chapter. He regained his awareness of God in his life. And God blessed him. He gave him double for his trouble. Aren't you glad we have a God that's going to give us double for our trouble down the road? I sure am. Well, here's the third thing, and I must hurry. The disciples gained their awareness of God in their life, not only through surrendering to his will, not only through being determined in their prayers, but also by appropriation of God's power. Appropriation is just a big word for activation, applying, activating, energizing the power of God. Remember in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus said, I will send the promise of the Father. But I want you to tarry here in the city of Jerusalem. That's where they tarried for 10 days in prayer. And then he said, then you will be endued with power from on high. So here we see in Acts chapter 2 that Disciples were gathered together. They were surrendered to his will. 
They were determined, they had a determination of praying for his purpose. And what happened? Do you remember what happened? The Holy Spirit came like a, a mighty rushing wind and clothed in tongues of fire. Begin to indwell them in a new and exciting way and, and fill them to the point that it, they were just engulfed with the presence and power of God. They begin to preach boldly about the crucified Savior and risen Lord of glory. When they appropriated that power, a fresh fellowship came back into their life. A power surged through their life and they did miracle after miracle. And when you and I learn to energize, apply, appropriate that power from on high, we're going to be restored to our first love again. His warmth and his closeness will flow through us. And guess what will happen? We'll experience an extraordinary fellowship. Not just with one another, but with God. Listen to what it says in, in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Very powerful scene of, of a spirit-filled fellowship. I don't know if we have it on the screen. If not, just listen to me as I read from the New King James Version. It says, And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did any one say that, it, or indeed, did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own? But they all had all things in common. And listen, verse thirty-three, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace came upon them all. Isn't that a marvelous picture of an extraordinary fellowship? Well. When you and I get to the end of the book of Job, and we will get there one of these days, all right? We're going to find out that Job had a new experience with God. It was new, it was vibrant, it was victorious. Job just didn't move back to where he used to be before everything fell apart. He had a new dimension of relationship with God. It was deeper, it was richer than anything he ever had in the past. Matter of fact, in the end of the book of Job, Job says, I've heard of thee with the hearing of my ears, and now I see you with my own eyes. He had a new depth into the relationship of God, and his future was better than his past. There could not have been a, a due dimension of Job's life with God unless there was a new fresh commitment. How would you all like to have a, a fresh start? I, I know I would. You know, I, I know I'm 59 years of age, but I want to stay fresh. Amen. I want to have a fresh start. You and I cannot have a fresh start until we repent of our own old ways. Amen. And if you and I are going to do more than just long for the good old days that God was so powerful and God was so present and God was, uh, Holy Spirit was so dynamic in our life, then, then we've got to go back to those times when we used to turn from ourselves and our sins to the Savior. And I really believe that when you and I rededicate ourselves to a new, exciting passion for Jesus, there'll be a new excitement, a new exuberance. And we will recapture those times in the new times when God was so real, Jesus was so precious, and the Holy Spirit was so dynamically powerful in our lives. I'm looking for a new start. How about you? Amen. All of us want a new start. We never get too old to get renewed. <laughs> Amen. As I've said before, I love what God said to Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Remember what he said? He said, ponder not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing, and I will spring it up, and you will perceive it. And I will build roads in the wilderness, and will bring rivers into the desert. And all of God's people said, amen to that.